Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Foz. I'm a software engineer at Uber, and I'm also the co-founder and executive director of Hashtag Moving Forward. We are a social movement addressing the huge power imbalances in venture capital. We started about one year ago, and in that time, 118 VC firms around the world have joined our movement. These are some of the top names in VC worldwide. Think Andreessen Horowitz, Greylock, Sequoia, Y Combinator, 500 Startups, the list goes on. And we're founded by an all-volunteer team of software engineers and entrepreneurs. Today, I'll be talking about power imbalances in venture capital. Why they're here, what we're doing to fight them, and what you can do. Here's our agenda. First, we'll characterize the power imbalances in VC. Second, we'll discuss what our team has done to level the playing field. And finally, we'll explore the role that you have to play in all of this. You'll see my Twitter handle at the bottom of the slide. If you have questions or comments, thoughts, as I'm speaking, then please tweet at me and I'll take time to respond after. So, power imbalances. They happen in a number of different industries, but today, I'll be focusing on venture capital. And in VC, the power imbalance that exists is between entrepreneurs and investors. So this will look familiar to many of you. These are the various stages that a founder will go through when they're looking to secure capital for their venture. So early on, They'll ask friends and family to pitch in. They might find an angel investor to help them explore different parts of their idea. And then once they've solidified their concept, they'll go to raise a seed round. And then of course, if things go well, they'll move on to series A and series B and series C funding, and then maybe even beyond that. But it turns out that the skills an entrepreneur needs to raise capital towards the earlier rounds of fundraising are very different than the skills that are required for later fundraising rounds. So in later rounds, by the time you're at Series A or Series B maturity, there are a lot of business metrics that investors can look at to assess how you've been doing can look at the finances, the team you've built, your history of being able to scale quickly and effectively. In the earlier stages, these metrics don't yet exist. So investors need to look at more qualitative aspects of the entrepreneur. That could be their early team, it could be the market they're going after, and a lot of it rides on the charisma and smarts of the founder. Now, founders in their earliest days of raising VC can often have a hard time getting in front of investors. Investors are very busy. There's high demand for their time and attention. And so an early entrepreneur will take any opportunity he or she gets to be in front of a VC. That means that often, entrepreneurs will be pitching at social gatherings or conferences like this or parties, bars. And that's when lines can sometimes start to get blurred. Take, for example, Catherine Minshew. Now, Minshew is the founder of a company called The Muse. They connect people looking for new jobs with people who have job experience of that sort. 
and they've helped over 50 million people find the right job for them. Minshu founded The Muse in 2011, and when she was very early in early stages of the company, two, three months in, she was invited to a dinner. It was a pretty exciting dinner to have an invitation to because a lot of prominent investors and other very successful entrepreneurs were also invited. So she goes and while there, she meets an investor who expresses particular interest in her business. He suggests that she send him a deck and that they meet the following week to dive into the idea in more detail. So she follows up. She sends the deck. She schedules a meeting with his assistant, 3 p.m. Tuesday. It's 2 p.m. on Tuesday, and Minshu receives a hurried email. Hey, it's one of those days. I'm going to need to push back our meeting. How about 8 p.m. tonight at my hotel bar? A little unfortunate, but same day, and it's through his assistant, so sure. She shows up at 8. They start by kind of reviewing her deck, and they're jamming, and it's going well, and he recommends that they move from the table they're sitting at over onto the couch on the other side of the bar. So they move over to the other side, and she sits down, and he sits down like right next to her, like kind of body leaning up against her body next to her. So a little scoot, and then his arm is around her back, and it's starting to feel uncomfortable. So she brings the topic back to business, not personal life anymore, and he isn't taking the cue. Um, at the point at which she's almost literally like pushing him off of her, she gets fed up and decides to leave. Okay, so this is one example, and it happened in the US, but we've seen in the past year and a half, a number of entrepreneurs speaking out about situations not dissimilar from this that affected their ability to fundraise. And when we dive a little bit deeper into some of the numbers behind who is securing VC funding internationally and who is not, these numbers reflect that there may be more issues at play than we realize every day on the surface. For example, 17% of companies internationally have a female co-founder. And there are different conventions around who like, gets to be a co-founder in different startups. In some startups, there are two co-founders. I'm aware of startups where there are six, seven co-founders. So if we decide to look at this term a little more precisely, if we say a co-founder only means two women starting a startup together, or one woman and one man starting a startup together, if that's our definition, then it's 11% of startups led by women. And this statistic has actually been the same since 2012. So we're going on seven years of this number not moving. We also see that at different rounds of raising VC fundraising, women secure less and less of the capital available. By the time you get to later stage rounds, Series B, Series C, female entrepreneurs are securing 8% of late stage deals and 7% of late stage dollars. This is Danielle Weinblatt. She's the founder of Take the Interview, which is an online video interview platform. When Weinblatt was 
starting to raise money for her venture for the first time, she was surprised by how many investors would say to her, hey, you should talk to this female investor I know about getting funding. Now, it's not true that a person can only raise money from a person who looks like them. Obviously, that's wrong and incorrect, and a lot of companies that are great would not be here today if that was the case. But for a moment, let's pretend that those are the constraints that Weinblatt is operating in. What are her options? Well, if she's in the UK, 18% of VC investors are female. If she's in the US, only 9%. I have spent this whole week looking for this number for the Baltic regions, and I cannot find it. So if anybody knows it, I would love to talk to you after. It's not just women who have a hard time securing capital for their businesses. Discrimination is rampant, and I would argue worse, at least in the US. So these are US statistics, and we are a very racially diverse country, but the senior investment teams for US VC firms are only 1% black and 1% Latinx. And then if we look at entrepreneurs who were receiving VC funding, only 13%, so about one in 10, are people of color. 2017 was a year when a lot of stories about this problem came to the forefront. And there were a few events in the US that triggered this and made the topic a huge deal and widely talked about. So first in February, there was a blog post written by Susan Fowler about her experiences as a female engineer. That blog post resulted in Travis Kalanick, the founding CEO of Uber, choosing to step down from the role mid-year. And then five of the most prominent investors in the US, including Chris Saka and Steve Jurvenson and Dave McClure and Shirvan Pishnavar, they were all accused of sexual harassment and then fired from firms they founded. And then of course, we're all aware of the hashtag MeToo movement that got off the ground towards the end of the year. When I think about these stories in 2017, and I think about, okay, what are the underlying issues here? What's beneath them? Two themes come to mind. The first is transparency. When something happens, if somebody feels they've experienced harassment, if somebody has been discriminated against, it's really unclear what to do. Like, should you report? How do you report? What does that look like? What protections exist? It's very murky. On the accountability side, a lot of organizations that have had things happen to them as far as harassment and discrimination are concerned, these are organizations that are actually pretty buttoned up. Like, a lot of them have a policy, and a lot of them have a mechanism for reporting. And still, often, that's not enough. All right, moving on to agenda item two, leveling the playing field. I'm going to tell you all a story. Now, it's a story that happened to me and my team. But let's pretend for a minute that you are living it right along with us. So it's November of 2017. You may remember some of the news from that time. The Queen and Prince Philip celebrated their 70-year wedding anniversary. This Da Vinci painting, shown in the middle, was sold for $450 million, the most any art, work of art has ever sold for. And then, of course, just two or three weeks ago, the world started 
pulsing with cries of hashtag me too. You have been invited to a dinner party. It's a dinner party in San Francisco in the Mission, a very central neighborhood. And it's for female entrepreneurs. 10 female entrepreneurs are attending and you're one of them. So you show up and people start chatting and talking and a question emerges from the group, which is, have you been harassed during fundraising? Okay, recall there are 10 people in the room. How many do you think had been harassed? 10? Anyone else? Two. Five out of 10. And then the next question that comes up is, wait, but how do you know if you've been harassed? Like, what does that even mean? And everyone else attending the dinner is like, I guess we don't even have a common definition of what harassment is. So next, somebody asks, Okay, so for those of you who have experienced harassment, were you protected under a VC legal agreement? Was there a document that told you your rights? What do you think? Was there a document? No. How many people think yes? How many people have no idea? Okay, yeah, so all of us actually had no idea. Like, we didn't even know if the document existed. No one at the dinner knew. So if you don't know, what would you do? Google, Google it? Yeah, that's a good idea. Googling it? Forget about it? Not my problem, no. Um, we did a bunch of Googling and research, and specifically for the research piece, we asked our friends and contacts, business connections in VC. Is there a policy? What happens? And our friends in VC were like, we don't know. Okay, so then we said, so, like, what should I do if I'm harassed by someone at your firm? Do you want me to like take a screenshot and send you a weird text? Like show you it was creepy? The VCs didn't really know how they wanted to proceed. So at this point, a number of us who had attended the dinner have been talking for a while and we're brainstorming. And remember, our co-founding team is all software engineers and entrepreneurs. There's this concept in the software world called open source. And the idea behind open source is that code that you write that you think could be useful to someone else can be published. And when you publish it, the code is open to anyone who wants to use it. They can choose to contribute their own features or give advice about how it could be written better. And there's this natural conversation between the creators of the product, and the community of people using the product. So we thought, hmm, is there a way to apply open source principles to this problem? Because at the root of open source, the reason why it works is because it relies on transparency and accountability. On the transparency side, everyone sees exactly how the code is written and exactly how the code is changed. And then there's accountability because if you wrote a feature that didn't work, it's your job to fix it. So we decided to translate these open source principles into a social movement, venture moving forward, where we collect policies from VCs and pool them in this centralized repository that anyone can access so VCs can see each other's work and entrepreneurs can see what different firms are doing in this area. 
We decided on a launch date. We gave ourselves about six weeks to reach out to as many VCs as possible. And we let some of our favorite reporters know that a social movement was starting in venture capital. There were two main pieces of what we asked VCs to do if they wanted to join our movement. The first piece was they had to write a policy. And the policy would address what, first of all, what a definition was that the firm had agreed upon for harassment and for discrimination. And then firms would need to lay out what they would do if these things happened at the firm. And then the second piece is we asked each firm to provide a reporting point of contact, which was an individual who already worked at the firm, who was trained to receive reach outs from individuals who may have experienced harassment or discrimination and to kick off the right processes internally at the firm. When we launched on March 8th of last year, it was a huge moment. We got a lot of coverage in news media and we were really proud to be able to display at that point 41 VC commitments to have policies and resources in place to address these issues. Since then, we've grown to work with 118 firms around the world, and we are launching in Europe on March 8th, which is two weeks from now. We're actually overjoyed that we just received our first commitment from a Baltic VC firm to join our movement. So congratulations to Change Ventures, who was our earliest adopter here. So this is where we are now, and we're hoping that two weeks from now, you'll see a zillion yellow pins all over Europe. Finally, okay, so what is your role in all of this? Well, it depends on who you are. If you're an investor, a few things. First, you can seek out diverse founders, actively looking for people of different backgrounds and experiences and listening to hear their ideas. Second, you can advocate for more inclusive hiring practices at your firm something we've seen a number of firms adopt in the past year is a commitment to hiring or to interviewing at least one underrepresented person for each open leadership role. You can also just do the daily work of making your culture friendly. Like if you sense that somebody might be uncomfortable, you can approach them or ask them about it or intervene. That's the really hard daily work that is easier to ignore and not to do, but matters a lot in the long run. And then finally, you can join Hashtag Moving Forward, which I explained before means creating a policy to address how harassment and discrimination will be handled, and then identifying a reporting contact at your organization. And then if you're an entrepreneur, or a future entrepreneur, a few things. One, you can choose your money carefully, by which I mean there's a big movement afoot right now called the Founders for Change movement, in which founders pledge that when they go to raise VC, they will consider the diversity and inclusion policies of the VC firm as part of their calculus for deciding whether or not they want that firm to be involved in their round. So that's a huge way you can participate. Additionally, you can support underrepresented founders. Entrepreneur communities are strong and there's a lot of resource sharing and supporting each other and making sure that you're proactively including people who may not feel as much belonging in the community as you do is a huge way you can help. And finally, if you're an entrepreneur, you're building an organization. 
you're probably, hopefully, building a huge, impactful organization someday. And you can think about these topics and make sure that you have the right systems in place at your own company early, writing a policy early, for example. Did this spark any questions or thoughts? If so, I'd love to speak with you after, or you can tweet at me and I'll respond there. Thank you. <laughs>